Welcome everybody to the June uh, Geek Cast Fender Spotlight with Avic. Uh, I'm joined with Steve and Michael. Um, they're going to be discussing uh, root cause analysis with me today. Um, so I'm super excited. I hope everyone in chat super excited. Uh, root cause analysis is one of the things that uh, everyone needs, but not everyone is good at. So. Um, I'm looking forward to what we're going to discuss. So, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, I'll turn it over to Steve, and uh, he can kick us off. Thanks so much, Kyle. Definitely appreciate it. Um, we're pumped to be here today to talk about root cause analysis. I've brought um, our SME on the topic, Michael, with me. Um, I have a, a bit to add in here, but he's really the the star of the show. Uh, there's a couple of questions just as we got started, like, is this going to be, you know, AVIC focused or, you know, more generic, you know, what we're really wanting to talk about is um, root cause analysis, but more generically, right? And we'll use some network monitoring examples, network management examples, um, but really it's about, you know, uh, helping the community sort of mature their processes and some of the, the things that, you know, not necessarily focused on what AVIC does, so not dive right into all of our specifics, but some things that we've learned along the way that are, um, you know, best practices that we can share. So I'll go ahead and share my screen there. Everyone should be able to see it. Just uh, Kyle, Mike, maybe you guys can confirm you guys see it all right there. I can see it. Yep, we're good. I, I can see it too. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, just diving in a little bit, uh, I know we got some names out of the way, but to get some um, introductions, my name is Steve Petrushek. I'm what we call our technology advocate here at Avic. Uh, it means I spend a lot of time out in the community um, you know, I would be in person, but we're stuck here in Canada where we're still quarantined a little bit. So uh, that means I'm stuck here in my, in my home office, uh, interacting with a lot of folks um, in, you know, uh, communities here and other outside communities as well. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in the uh, sales and product organizations uh, here at Avic, And so a lot of experience with uh, the tools. And before that, I was actually working for a security bar as a um, uh, sort of a reseller. So I've lived in that channel world before. We weren't an MSP. We were a um, a, a reseller who had our own sort of support desk and everything like that. So we were getting towards that MSP, but not quite all the way there. Um, anyway, that's a little bit about me. I'll pass it over to Michael to introduce himself a little bit. Yeah. Hi there. I'm uh, Michael Brown. I'm a technical director here at Avic. Uh, I've been in the company for about seven years. So seen a lot of growth and a lot of changes in, in the way that we uh, handle things internally and, and, uh, um, my role right now is, is that I'm responsible for the product design and architecture, um, you know, mapping out the technical strategy and the evolution of our tech stack and, and kind of building a, a culture of engineering uh, excellence here at Avic. Um, got lots of experience previously in, in security and, and some software prototyping and, and roadmap uh, kind of development at, at BlackBerry uh, in Waterloo. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, I have a master's in mathematics in, in quantum computing, which is something I'm trying to figure out how to work into my day-to-day -day life. But so far it, it eludes me a bit, but oh, uh, we're going to have some conversations about that probably <laughs> offline, but that's going to happen. Sure. Yeah. Sounds great. <laughs> Bring it up in the Q and A. Sounds like the perfect Q and A topic. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, so, so let's dive in. Um, I'm going to start off by saying like, you know, I'm going to use the word RCA a lot. So I, you know, I've tried to inject a joke in here. Um, I am a father, so I got to start off with a dad joke. Like, hey, I thought RCA was that brand of TV I used to have in the 1980s. Um, well, it's not. Uh, it, it, what we're going to be talking about specifically is, is root cause analysis. And so what is RCA? Thanks for the chuckle. Appreciate it in the, in the chat there. Um, so the, the idea here is that with a root cause analysis, what we're trying to understand is like that highest level cause uh, of an issue or that first sort of domino to fall. Uh, so if you think about like the, the domino set up in series, like the symptom, what we end up seeing at the end of the day is the last domino falling over, right? The last thing that happens. But what we want to do is we want to back that up as far as we can to understand what was the first thing that happened uh, that sort of led to that end result or led to that incident. Uh, and, and we want to do that for a variety of reasons, which we'll dive into a little bit. Um, Kyle, did we end up getting the, uh, the poll set up in here? Uh, yes. All right. So I'm going to, I guess, as we move forward, next thing I want to do is just get an understanding of sort of where everyone's at with their root cause analysis. So uh, if you were to describe what it's like today, uh, is it, uh, if you want to just answer that uh, question, the poll, sort of like, what is an RCA? We have one that's kind of informal. We have a formal RCA process, or we got it, and it's awesome. We're about halfway answered. Um, 
Awesome. I see it popped up on my screen as well here. I need the Jeopardy theme song here to, to kick in or something. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't have a music queued up. I'm not prepared. <laughs> that didn't come up uh, in the dry run, right? So. <laughs> yeah, true. It's true. Um, so the majority of people, uh, they have one, but it's informal, um, followed by what is an RCA process? <laughs> and it's not that TV that you have in your, from the 1980s. Um, so to be honest, that's more or less what I was expecting uh, the result to be. Um, I think it's one of those things that we're all you know, somewhat familiar with. We've probably heard the term before. Uh, it's something that we've all probably been aware that you know, we, we should be doing. Um, but you know, let's talk a little bit today about formalizing that a little bit more and some of the best practices around that. So unless, Kyle, if there's any other comments you wanted to make on the, the poll there at all. Uh, no, I'll share the results. I don't know how that works. We'll find out. Yeah, they, they can they can see it. I think. Cool. Uh, yeah, no, it's 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 what I expected it to be. Um, some people have a formal one, but it could use an update, which is normal. So yeah, it looks good. I'm curious who the two are that said, uh, "Hey, our RCA process is awesome." Um, you know, one thing that I've learned is, well, I mean, it can be awesome, but there's always still room for improvement, right? There's never, you're never at that finished state. It's never completely, completely polished. Yep. Oh. Cool. So let's uh move on a little bit here so yeah a, a lot of a, yeah we why 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 are we talking about root cause analysis and and why why should we conduct these sorts of investigations and and there's sort of two two reasons really there's benefit to you and there's benefit to your customers and so let's let's talk about each of these what's in it for you so first of all it's really important to have a clear definition of the cause of an incident, any incident, so that you can actually fix that cause and not just keep patching the symptoms. So you don't just want to be applying uh, fixes to the end symptom, uh, that, that final symptom over and over again without trying to back it up and figure out what actually caused that thing in the first place. Um, really, the, the underlying uh, desire to do this is to prevent the same thing from happening again, uh, right? We, we, the goal would be to prevent a similar thing from happening in the future. Now, obviously, we can't be always prevent every single occurrence of the same problem happening again, but uh, can we mitigate the risk somehow? Can we decrease the probability of it happening? Um, it's important to kind of have accountability for the problem. Uh, we don't want to blame individuals. It's, it's like, you know, that, that certainly at AVIC, our culture is not to, not to blame people for mistakes that they've made. But as a corporation or a company, you, you can't get better if you don't know why the person that was ultimately responsible didn't have all of the information they needed and uh, why, they, why the, the problem happened. Um, and you know what, uh, you know, depending on the cause, there's potentially some upsell opportunities too. You know, if it, looked, if it was overloaded hardware, for example, maybe there's an opportunity to get in there and, uh, and, and sell some, something better to the customer to, to prevent it from happening in the future as well. So a, a bit of a selfish uh, aspect there too, but. Uh, Hey, it's business, right? <laughs> yeah. So, the, so the other, the flip side, then, sort of, what's in it for your customer, right? Obviously, um, understanding uh, the actual cause or like you know that first domino to fall will ultimately result in a better service for your customer, right? So, if um, if you just solve the symptom, it's likely to happen again, and then the customer is going to be frustrated again. So, if we you know solve the root cause, they'll get better service, um, and and it's better uh, accountability for you as well, right? For you to be able to come to the client and say, hey, like th this wasn't just the symptoms that happened. Here's the actual cause. And here's what we've done to prevent the cause. Uh, it, it allows you to build more rapport with your customers. It solidifies you as that, that business partner as well. Um, and you know, I, I think, although we kind of position uh, upsell opportunities, hey, if it was an equipment problem or equipment failure, hey, I can sell them new equipment. Um, there's also you know, a benefit for that in the customer as well. If, if, if there is a legitimate problem with some of their underlying uh, network infrastructure or um, you know, outdated equipment, then upgrading that or updating that does have a, have a benefit to that, uh, that end client. The, the example I like to give here is that, you know, if we're, um, if you go to a doctor and say, uh, you know, my, my leg broke when I fell down the stairs, if they just stop at, you know, repair or putting a cast on your leg and fixing that broken bone, that's great. Well, like, well, why did you fall down the stairs? All right. Um, and back that up to figure out, well, you know, maybe you, you blacked out for a second and ultimately like you want to keep going backwards to help to understand, well, what caused you to fall down the stairs in the first place? Um, the doctor wouldn't be doing their job if they just stopped at saying, okay, let's just repair that broken bone, right? They need to understand what happened, understand if there's something more than just, um, you know, a, an accident there. 
So yeah, it's uh, it's also really good so that you you don't your technicians um, don't have to constantly work on the same issue, or you don't have to, you know, you know, you don't get recurring troubleshooting tickets which is technically the same thing. And, you know, as someone who maybe didn't work it last time, I have to go track down your ticket to see what you did to fix it. And now everyone's wasting more time when you could have just fixed it the first time without having, you know, duplicate work. Right, exactly. So we're kind of introducing some themes that'll come up throughout the rest of the presentation as well, because we're uh, you know, setting the stage here. I think we all sort of understand a lot of the concepts, but let's, let's keep moving forward. Um, and I guess the question that I like to, to ask is, what does that mean that everything I do needs this full RCA process? Yeah, I mean, the short answer here, right, is no. Like, you, you'd be spending a lot of time doing RCAs if every time a tiny thing went wrong, you were doing it. But, uh, you know, humans, at least in my experience, humans tend to do a bit of an informal RCA every time something unexpected happens. So, you know, looking at the slide, I, I dropped my, my coffee so why did I do that? Oh yeah, I was trying to text uh, text someone at the same time and I lost my grip and, and it fell on the ground. And so maybe I shouldn't try to text while I'm holding that coffee at the same time. That's a bit of an RCA, but um, you know, what we're talking about here is a little bit more formality to it, right? They're, we're talking about documenting it, uh, getting more people involved. Um, the, the process for an RCA really is, shouldn't be designed to take days and days to complete, but it does require some time and some investment and some significant thought. And so it's a bit of a judgment call as to when you initiate it. Um, and so depending on your business, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, depends a lot on your customers, the kinds of service you're providing. Uh, there might be some really specific conditions that should trigger an RCA, but there's some also some general rules of thumb. So you know, if there's significant unexpected downtime for your customers, probably that's RCA worthy. Uh, maybe you got a complaint or even feedback from your customer, or maybe even a, an explicit request for an RCA, which happens sometimes. Um, obviously, if someone's asking you, please give me an RCA, you want to be able to give them something. Um, if there was data loss for a customer or some sort of security or data privacy event, uh, or if there were you know, financial implications where if you had to make a billing adjustment to compensate a customer for a, a, a lack of service for a period of time or something like that, um, these are sorts of examples of when you might initiate an RCA. Uh, obviously, your specific circumstances, uh, it'll, de it'll depend on those. But um, one really important thing to note is that um, sometimes when something goes wrong, you don't know why and you don't know whose fault it was. And it might not even be your fault at the end of the day. But if you can't answer that right away, um, then really you should be thinking instead of the severity of the incident that you're talking about. Um, if you can't look right away at the problem and I immediately identify the root cause, which most of the time, let's face it, we can't for a, for a complex issue, you need to dive in deeper and there will be lots to learn for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, in, in my mind, I picture it kind of like a, a you know, going to the, a tier list. Like if this is just a standard issue and it's obviously if someone is entering their fat fingering their Outlook password, I'm not going to do an RCA. But if their Outlook isn't connecting, I'm going to do a very minimal RCA, you know, I'm not going to do like the whole list of, you know, the whole process, but I may do a cut down version of it. But to extend your analogy, if that same person is fat fingering their keyboard every single day, and it's taking up time from your service desk every single day or every single week, then I'm going to do probably a little bit more of an informal one to figure out, you know, like, what can I do so that they're not, you know, impacting my help desk as much. Yep. Yeah. Anyway. Format uh, all tickets to the trash. <laughs> Probably, yeah. that's, that's one way to, to decrease the help desk volume. That's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, now, I guess it all depends on whether it's the, the person who signs your invoice at the end of the month or not, right? So. That's true, very true. And if, you're, if you have the, uh, the, the authority to make that call? Yeah, exactly. At the same time? So really, what are some of the fundamental questions that any RCA should answer? And, and I think it boils down to these three things. What happened? So description of, of what happened, why did it happen? And then finally, really the most important thing, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying, I'm gonna talk about this a lot through the rest of the presentation. How do we prevent it from happening again? And like I said earlier, maybe we can't guarantee that we'll prevent it, but we really wanna to try to drive down the risk of it happening again. Uh, and so typically part of the output of an RCA are recommendations or things that we need to implement as a company to say, how do we prevent this thing from happening again? Otherwise, why are we even bothering to talk about it? And so we'll, we'll, um, 
we'll talk about these things, uh, these three things a lot. But the last one for me is actually the, the most important and the most complicated to answer in many ways. So for most of the rest of the uh, discussion, uh, we were going to drive towards using a specific example. Um, that way, if, as we're talking through a lot of these concepts, we're not just talking about like what ifs. Um, there probably will still be some what ifs because we're not bringing out a real example. Uh, you know, I'm not going to expose something that happened at Ovic where we did an RCA. I don't think any of our customers would want us to uh, expose any of their specific um, issues. So it's kind of like protecting the innocent. But what we're going to basically do is frame this around this example where we have a uh, a network device configuration change that's being applied. So someone's applying a configuration change to a core switch and it causes an outage. So you get uh, a client that has all of a sudden experiences uh, a fairly long period of downtime that ended up warrants us sort of triggering this RCA process. So we're gonna talk about this as the specific, specific example as we, uh, we walk through. So the first thing to do, you know, as, as you're starting this full process, I mean, really before you begin the process, we need to define the parameters for what your RCA process is gonna look like. And so the first thing that we sort of talked about already is, is when do you do an RCA? So I, you can start with some high level guidelines. You know, we gave a, an example, a few examples before, but ultimately these are things that you need to refine over time based on what works for your business and the experience you've had. So, um, you know, the, the degree or the, the severity of the incident is, uh, is, is really what you're looking for here. And as time goes on, you'll get more and more criteria that you can apply to figure out, is this something that's really worth the sort of the full RCA process? Or as Kyle was saying, is there a, it, do you have tiers of RCA processes where you'll invoke one or, or the other, depending on how severe the incident was? Um, it's really important to note uh, that even if it looks like the incident is similar to one that you've seen before, uh, if it's severe enough, it really is worth going through the whole process again to make sure that, first of all, that it actually was the same root cause. That's that's uh, something worth noting. A lot of incidents that happen might appear to be the same thing at the end of the day, but they might have actually been caused upstream by something very different. And so going through the full process is actually really important to make sure that this is another uh, occurrence of the same incident. If it is, it's also interesting to look back and say, hey, last time this happened, we did an RCA and we had some action items. Did we actually follow up on those? Uh, does this increase the priority of our follow-up tasks to make sure that, you know, even though this thing, we thought we understood why it happened and we put some, uh, some mitigation strategies in place, it happened again. Do we need new mitigation strategies? And so uh, even if things look like something you've seen before, sometimes if it's severe enough, it's worth uh, initiating the process a second time. Um, then we start talking about, you know, who should be included in the RCA. So typically, you know, you'll, in most cases, you'll have someone who is kind of running point on the issue. So, so your engineer or someone who's actually handling the issue. Uh, but quite often, uh, it's important to pull other people in as well. You don't want to have just that, uh, the, the view of one person, uh, one person's view of the incident kind of guiding the whole thing. And so, you know, who helped with the resolution of the issue? Uh, was there someone on call at the time who was involved in, uh, in, finding out about it and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, maybe the technical lead or, or the manager or team lead for, uh, for the, the engineer who was, who was involved, uh, you know, your service delivery manager, your VCIO, your CSM, whoever the, these people are, depending on, on the severity of the, of the incident, uh, you might need to, to bring uh, additional people in. Yeah, and the one point, you sort of hinted on it quickly, but I, I think one thing to keep in mind here is that, um, when we talk about who should be involved, it should be more than one person, right? To have just one person focus on or that, that whole RCA process um, on their own, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna be missing different viewpoints. So you'll want to understand from different perspectives what uh, they'll introduce new questions that maybe you didn't ask, explore new avenues that, uh, that you didn't ask. So it's, it's important to have at least, you know, a couple people involved in that process. Uh, there was a question here in the chat that is very, very important. Um, it's uh, how many pictures of polar bears you guys have in different poses? Uh, it's a lot. I think we only have this one in this presentation though. So I don't know if it's going to be that exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, another thing you need to, you need to define is, is who owns completing, uh, this RCA process. Um, certainly, uh, it's really important to have one documented person who is responsible for carrying out the steps of the RCA. Um, it's not a super glamorous job. I'll be honest. Um, not always that rewarding because quite often, you know, depending on 
on the situation and the the tension involved, you can uh, you can kind of turn that into a bit of a confrontational relationship if you're not careful. But um, ultimately, it's important that if that for one person to drive through the steps, if one person doesn't own uh, that process, it uh, it's kind of like no one owns it, and and quite often it can it can just not make it through to the end uh, uh, to the end state. So. Um, it doesn't have to be the same person for every single RCA you're carrying out. In fact, it, it's probably better if, you know, the, if the incident was related to a particular department, for example, that department should be driving the process. But in any case, it should be one person that's driving each one through. Um, we talk about the deliverables of an RCA. So uh, typically these things happen in a meeting or a, or a series of meetings uh, where people get together and, and discuss a a number of, of, of steps, and we'll, we'll talk about those in a second, but uh, it's important to have that meeting. It's important to keep notes and documentation of that meeting. Um, and uh, it, certainly, I think it's good practice to have a standard uh, form or a standard process that you're following. So essentially, you know, these are the steps, and you can go back and verify after the fact that you actually have carried out those steps in that order. Uh, and you've got good documentation and, and, I mean, ultimately, quality control of the RCA process to be able to to uh, make sure your team is understanding how the process should be implemented and that they're carrying it, carrying it out in an effective way. You know, one thing you mentioned there, there, Mike, was that to keep notes and documentation. So I think that's what really separates like the informal RCA process that a lot of us are probably already doing every day that we sort of talked about earlier, right? That we always just naturally as humans do it, try to your, your you know, coffee dropping example. Um, but the difference here is like, if we don't have the notes, if we don't have the documentation, then we forget about a lot of the learnings. So, you know, that's sort of the key cornerstone of any RCA, RCA process to make sure that there are, there is some sort of documentation that I can look back on it and I can, you know, remember what the decisions we made and what the findings were. So, so that's my two cents. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, then the, def uh, the defined steps. So, you know, as you drive towards formality in the process, you want to be repeating the same RCA process over and over. And that's not to say that it can't evolve or over time, you know, as you learn more and as you do more of these uh, analysis processes, you'll understand what works for your business and what doesn't. But at any time you should be able to say, okay, it's RCA time. What are the steps we have to follow? And so we're going to introduce uh, some ideas that you could use as a starting point for that. This is the fun slide. It's, um, uh, sort of that, that, where do I even start? And uh, I, I'm looking back now wishing that I had made this a more visually pleasing slide, slide, but this is where a lot of the meat is, a lot of the fun conversations hopefully we're going to have. Uh, so what we're going to basically walk through here is like, what are the different steps? What are the processes? And going back to the poll we had earlier, you know, uh, I think that there's something here that everyone will be able to take from it. Uh, there will be steps that you're like, hey, that's obvious. I'm already doing that. Um, <laughs> can we get a bear change? Unfortunately, it's too late for a bear change. Uh, but you know, how, how do we, um, you'll, you'll learn something from some of these steps anyway. Uh, and you'll probably recognize some of the terminology we use. Uh, there's a few different industry standards out there. There's a few different uh, organizations that have sort of built out these root cause analysis frameworks. Um, you know, Avic didn't invent the wheel on this stuff. We're sort of sharing some of the things that we've found are, are good best practices, uh, some things that we've learned along the way. Um, and so some of the things you'll see here, you know, may come from, uh, uh other tools you've seen in the past, um, Anyway, so remember, we have this example we're going to be working through. We're probably talking, uh, uh, talk through it a little bit where we're going to sort of be applying a network configuration change to a core switch, and that causes an outage. So we'll see where that comes up here in the, uh, in the examples. So first off is the lead up. Yeah, so really, this is describing uh, quite a fairly high level the sequence of events that led up to the incident. Uh, this is usually something you kind of know and, and you don't have to dig in too deep on. And in fact, you'll find as we go through maybe the first five or six steps, these are really just documenting what happened and having a written record of what people were doing at the time. And, uh, and that actually informs a lot of the later, more in-depth analysis that we'll talk about here. So, you know, in, in our case here, it might've been, there was a scheduled maintenance window and, uh, and um, at the end of it, uh, there was a, a customer outage. Um, the fault is next, you know, what went wrong? And, and usually this is pretty obvious, you know, in this case, our, you know, we applied a config change, we thought it would work and it didn't. Uh, you might have more detail at this point, you might know specifically what was in the config that was, that was incorrect or, that, or a, a, a command that was typed incorrectly or something like that. Um, but uh, really this is just what went wrong. So what led up to it, what went wrong? The next thing is the impact. Uh, how did uh, how did this fault impact 
users or people and and or systems. And so, you know, you're thinking about internal users. What happened to our teams internally? How did we have to? Uh, how how many of us were affected? Uh, external users, you know, typically customers. Uh, what was the impact to customers? Um, were there support cases raised, raised which uh, impacts your your uh, your tech support desk as well? And and uh, and so, what was the full the full impact of the event? And was it the uh, customer's CEO, or again going back to our conversation, was the guy that signs your check or not? Because that may also impact or have a uh, an impact on the impact. Right. This helps to kind of define the severity of the incident. So again, a lot of this you'll kind of know before you went in. If you don't have a good sense of what the impact was. Uh, then you know you probably don't have enough information to decide whether you should be running an RCA anyway. And so these many of these first few steps, like I said, are just documenting what happened uh, so that you'll have something to go back and refer to later. Um, the next step is detection. So when did your team detect the incident? Um, how did they know it was happening? Uh, you can imagine a case where the detection step was your customer called you and said, uh, by the way, our CEO can access the internet right now. And now your team is kind of scrambling. Maybe in a better situation, you've got some sort of proactive network monitoring tool that would have uh, given you an indication ahead of time that something was going wrong. Michael, uh, do you know any of those? Do you know any names? <laughs> of no, I don't want to turn this into a shameless product plug for Avic, but there's ways that we could help you in this case. Um, Sometimes here with detection, you can you can talk though about uh, ways that your team could have improved time to detection. And so, could you have could you have decreased that? Could you have somehow learned about it earlier? Um, a lot of the the more uh, in depth analysis of that question comes later in the process, but sometimes you know about that upfront. Um, the response time. So you know who responded to the incident? What did they do? Um, were there, did they run into any problems along the way? Uh, quite often you'll see in an RCA, you'll see almost a, like a timestamp log of events that happen. So at uh, six o'clock, the customer called in at 6.05, it was escalated to the right engineer at 6.06, he was diagnosing a problem, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how do we, you know, how did we respond to the situation? Um, and uh, then obviously after responding, you hope that the next step in that is recovery. And so uh, how, how did we finally mitigate the user impact? Uh, when did we finally deem that the incident was resolved? Um, and I think in here again, you can talk a bit about are there ways that we could have made that go faster? Uh, are there ways that we could have uh, Im improved the time to mitigation or resolution? And, um, and so I'd say like these, how many is that? Six steps so far. You know, we've talked through this in, in a few minutes. Uh, in, a, in a real RCA, it shouldn't take a whole lot longer than that. You've, you've got a lot of this information already. You're just documenting it for future, uh, for future reference. The, the meat of the RCA is what comes next, at least, at least in my mind. And uh, so this is where we get, yeah. Uh, audience ahead. participation time, uh, <laughs> you know, either in the chat or in the, uh, in the Slack channel or something. You know, does this all sound familiar? These things are all pretty, you know, Pretty straightforward things that you would have uh, done already, probably informally, right? Or Kyle, what's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, it's uh, like in my mind, I can like if if I get a trouble ticket and I'm working on an issue, in the first five minutes, I'm doing all of these steps in like this rapid assessment. Yeah. We could, you know, obviously, we don't, I don't get enough time to to not all the issues. I should say, you get time to sit down and be like, all right, well, we made this config change. It's more of this config change was made. Now I need to figure out what happened. I need to fix it first so they can get up and then I need to figure out what happened afterwards. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that's, go ahead, Mike. I was, I was going to say one of the things that's interesting sometimes when you go back on, on a uh, kind of a, a major incident is, is you look at the response timeline and uh, in the heat of the moment, of course, it feels like everything is happening so fast and that, and everyone's really uh, fully engaged in solving the problem. Sometimes if you go back and look at the response timeline, you, you realize, oh, there were big gaps in, in our response uh, along the way. How could we shorten those up and things like that? So just the exercise of going through and documenting these steps for major incidents is actually often quite insightful. So jumping in, this is where things get interesting and something that we've already sort of, I think, foreshadowed a little bit earlier. Um, but the next step is the five whys. Yeah, so five whys is exactly what it sounds like. It's asking why five times. <laughs> it's sort of like, this reminds me of when my kids were toddlers where it felt like this was my life all the time. 
and uh, and uh, but it's actually kind of instructive when you look at, at a case like this. And so, I mean, obviously this is all very hypothetical, I, uh, but uh, you know, there, there was an outage. That's the, that's the incident we're talking about. Well, why? Well, the core switch wasn't working properly. Okay, that, that was one why, but clearly that's not kind of the root cause of what we're talking about here. So let's ask why again. Well, okay, the wrong configuration was applied to the switch. Okay, well, why was that? Well, okay, the technician made a typo while they're attempting to change some port status and they accidentally shut off a port they weren't intending to. And uh, okay, that's three whys. Well, why did that happen? Well, like no one reviewed their work or no one was there to supervise what was happening. And this, okay, well, why not? Well, okay, we don't have a documented process for peer review of configuration changes. And so now we're getting at something that's actually kind of meaningful and, uh, and something we can really dig in on. Um, there was a, a gap in our process there. Yeah, and so they're like you've stopped at the five whys, right? And if we feel like we've sort of, it's sort of like a five why minimum is the way I approach it. If I've gotten to what I think is the root cause at that point, maybe we can stop there, or maybe we can keep asking why. Right? Like, why don't we have a documented process? Oh well, we've never had time to document that process. Why don't we have time to document that process? Oh well, our ratio from you know uh, text to clients is, is way off, and we're just serving too many people. We don't have enough time. So now we've taken what was like a really technical, and I mean, now we're getting pretty high level, but I've taken what is a technical problem up to a business problem um, and try to understand whether that's something that we should be addressing at the technical level or at the business level and, you know, really digging deep. So. Yeah, uh, Bob pointed out something in chat is that uh, he mentioned that if all this is documented and done, then you're almost ready for CMMC, um, which is, uh, for those who don't know, who aren't in the, the know, is one of the security standards from the US government that uh, is poised to be implemented across everyone, all managed service partners, potentially. Um, so, you know, it, it's things like that, that, you know, go a long way. Um, yeah. So I think that's take notes, I think is what uh, you just said, take, take notes. And if no one of this, write it in. So, yeah, I guess after the, the five whys, um, we dive into that blameless root cause you sort of alluded to earlier. Yeah, so really this is this is what was that root cause. And usually that's the last step of your five or six or seven whys analysis is that that's what we're calling the root cause. Um, we want to describe what needs to change. You don't really want to place blame on, on well, at least we don't. At Avic, we, we've got a very blameless culture. Uh, it's a pretty healthy culture, I think, in general. But um, we know people didn't intend to do something wrong, right? Like no one's, no one's going and, and applying these configuration changes with malicious intent. But... Um, Without understanding what the, that root cause was, then it makes it really hard to, to prevent it from happening in the future. And so uh, that's that's where trying to avoid confrontation in this process can actually be really beneficial. Where people you don't want people to feel defensive because if you don't understand what led to them making a mistake, uh, it's really hard to prevent it in the future. And so trying to keep it blameless as much as possible is, uh, helps with the transparency and the and the detailed kind of insight that you need into these sorts of problems. Yeah, so, so to give like the specific example with our configuration change, I wouldn't say like, you know, John doesn't know how to configure a switch. It would be something more along the lines of um, our the training for our technicians on how to configure switches is, needs work or is not, you know, up, up to par rather than putting the blame on that person. Yeah, you always want to find the, the, the true root cause. It's not the fact that, you know, John Smith uh, <laughs> typed in a delete commit when he should have typed in something else it's it, it's the fact that he wasn't properly trained on how to service this specific instance so you need to make right. sure that if you're doing this that you're not stopping at something that seems obvious when could be fixed by you know making sure that they're properly trained or you have a proper process or you have something documented correctly because you know hey i'm following this documentation but it says to delete and i deleted I mean, oh, right, <laughs> right, right. All the things that we love in IT, right? Yeah. Process, documentation, training, everything. Oh, I, I so wake good. up and just can't wait oh, to do. Yeah. <laughs> so we've gotten to the blameless root cause. Now it's time to start pivoting to like the path forward, right? And so we'll start off with sort of the lessons learned. Yeah. And so this, this again, depends a lot on, on your business and, and what you've kind of uncovered as part, as part of the, uh, the previous steps. But really here, you want to talk about what have we learned during this process? Uh, what parts of 
of uh, what happened were good sometimes. Like uh, you, you might find, hey, look, our response time was fantastic. As soon as we knew there was a problem, we knew exactly how to remedy it and, and uh, got the fix out to our customers as quickly as possible. That's a great lesson to learn. Um, sometimes you learn, quite often you learn harder lessons than that. Like, well, oh boy, configuration changes on certain devices are risky. It's, it's really easy with our process for a single person to make a mistake. That's something maybe, you know, hypothetically you could learn in a situation like this. Uh, a senior technician should be involved in configuration changes on certain types of equipment uh, that, uh, you know, maybe that wasn't part of your process before, but based on what you've uncovered by going through this, you kind of have learned that lesson and you want to incorporate that into your process. Um, finally, really, I think the most important thing in the RCA is this idea of follow-up tasks. It's great to carry out these first nine steps and to say, okay, we learned something, uh, but if you don't do anything about what you've learned, then all of this could just happen again, right? So how are you going to take the things that you learn and put them into practice? So um, it's really some important points here is who's responsible for the follow-up tasks? Um, when do they have to complete the work? Is there a deadline on it? And uh, how are we gonna track that the work is done? How are we going to, uh, to sort of socialize it around the rest of the team? So, you know, if we, we talk about this example, you know, if, if the root cause is, well, we, we need a peer review process for configuration changes. Well, who's responsible for creating and documenting that peer review process? Who's going to incorporate it into the training materials for new employees? Who's going to present it to our existing employees to make sure everyone understands the change in process? And, yeah, that's and a big one for me. Yeah, is, how, is information dissemination. That's right. That's right. And I mean, yeah, how, how are we going to enforce it even really, right? Like, I mean... Yeah, go ahead, Kyle. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's it's fine. Um, it's it it goes back to that. I mean, that's one of the most that's the co most commonest complaint I've ever heard of is, well, no one told me. Um, I mean, I we had a an issue with a client uh, at a previous job of mine where they made a uh, judgment call at the sales call and lowered their SLA response time and didn't tell anyone on the help desk. <laughs> So, you know, there's, it, it goes back to, to that type of information. That's an, that's a critical piece of information that's causing us to, to upset the client, to, to not properly be able to do what we need to do. And it's just information dissemination. So as soon as we were told, we made sure to fix that issue, but you know, it, it, you gotta, you gotta make sure that that's probably the most critical thing to me, at least is just you know, whatever the resolution is, whatever the, the fix is that that information on the calls and the resolution is disseminated properly. Making sure one person is responsible then for disseminating that information, mm -hmm. right? So again, as we talked about earlier, if someone's not tagged as being responsible for it, then everyone, you know, kind of assumes it's that person's job. And so like, you know, you, you have to make one person ultimately responsible for making sure that happens. So the, you know, a lot of detailed steps. I think there was 10 total here in, in this outline. Um, and that sort of, you know, brings us to the end. I, I guess at this point, probably start to reflect on some of um, what your process looks like internally. And, you know, if there's something in here that, that you could add in, I'm hoping that there's something there that, um, you know, fits for everyone. But if we think about what we went back to right at the beginning, it was sort of like this, this three-step process. And that's that example of this really, really light RCA process that is just, you know, what happened, why did it happen, and how can we pre prevent it from happening again? And so if I don't have anything today, for those few people who <laughs> sort of answer that, hey, I don't do anything, that's, you know, where we should start. Yeah, and, and that last point seems obvious, right? How do we prevent it from happening again? Or how do we reduce the probability that it will happen again? Um, like Kyle and others were saying, it, it's often the hardest one of all. Um, you know, Often the root cause of the problem comes down to a gap of some kind. Usually it's a gap in someone's understanding or our process as a company. Um, preventing it from happening again or reducing the probability actually means filling that gap somehow. And that's things like training and process improvements and security controls and all of these sorts of things. They take time to design and implement. Um, if you don't take the time to do that, then what prevents it from happening again? And so following up on these recommendations from the RCA really is a, a, critical, a critical part of the process. In fact, almost the, the most important of all. So if you already have some sort of a skeleton in place, something you've already got sort of those basic steps, um, you know, I have a couple of points. I think Mike has a couple of points to bring in here for things that, um, that I would say are key takeaways from today that you should look to start to include uh, in your process moving forward. Um, 
And so first is, you know, reflect on your current uh, RCA process and say, well, what pieces am I missing, right? And some of it you may decide is overkill for your process. And that's totally okay, right? You, you can decide what works for your business. Um, one of the things that I always do every time um, I've gone through a, an incident, whether it's, you know, here at Ovig or, or elsewhere, um, or in my personal life or anything, it's, you know, what worked well in the last RCA process and what didn't work well. So not just reflecting on the issue that happened, but then reflecting on the process. So you can probably have um, an inception kind of happening here and then reflect on the process of reflecting on the process of reflecting. But, but really like, you know, what worked about our RCA process and what didn't? So we can continue to streamline that process. These things, um, you know, they don't get built overnight and ultimately you're gonna probably iterate towards an RCA process that works for you, right? Um, as we sort of talked about, RCA processes aren't always that glamorous, um, but if you highlight what worked well and what the good learnings were from it, you can also motivate your team uh, to keep them engaged and continue to do these moving on. Yeah, but like Steve said, sometimes this doesn't feel very glamorous. And, and yet when, we, when you think about why we're doing them, it's actually to improve the service that we're providing to customers, right? The, this, there is real value that comes out of doing these, uh, these sorts of analyses. And so um, you'll, find, you'll find there are probably people in your organization who actually really like this kind of uh, detailed analysis and digging in and finding out and solving problems and driving them through to resolution. Um, there, it's a, maybe a rare breed depending on, depending on uh, who, who you talk to, but uh, there are people who really like doing this. Um, the key I would say is that following up on and implementing the recommendations that come out, I'd sound like a broken record. That is really super important. So you, you really, if you haven't followed up on those recommendations, you haven't done anything to make sure it's not going to happen again next time. And so um, having a way to track that, to assign uh, accountability for it and to follow up on, on the recommendations is a really important part of the process that uh, tends to get overlooked uh, in, in general. So with that, we're more or less towards the end of the prepared content. If there are questions either in the Q&A or in the chat or anything that anyone wants to ask, more than happy to, to take those questions. Um, there was only one question and I already answered it. Uh, how does quantum computing work? The answer was magic quarks was just <laughs> what I gave. Um, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't and you don't know which one. How about that? That's, uh, <laughs> that's that is, that is, I like that. That's good. <laughs> Should, that's what I should have answered with. <laughs> yes. Um, but so far, um, I have to answer with a probability. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yes. Cross you can't observe correct. the system because then you're going to change the outcome. Look, I don't have a master's <laughs> in quantum computing. Okay. <sighs> <laughs> well, if it's any consolation, I don't use mine very often. So you can. Yeah, you're, you're in a different industry. <laughs> 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 Um, I am going to drop just a couple of links in the chat um, because we're here and because we're Avic and a vendor, I kind of want to uh, give you guys some resources. So if you're in, if you're not an Avic partner and you want to check it out, I first link is sort of bringing you to a trial. Um, also, if you are a partner, I just dropped a link in as well to uh, you're, you're sending that to us. You may want to send it to everyone. Oh, I just sent it to just the panelists. Yeah, I did. I was doing the same thing earlier. Don't worry. Oh. <laughs> oh. Painful. <laughs> Fail. Yeah, I, I, I like. I was talking to someone, and I was like, "Yeah, that's 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 good." And I'm like, "Wait a second, they didn't see that." Um, yeah. Oh, here we go. Live. This is real. This is real time. Uh, are there any good forms of RCA that already exist? For any good forms for RCA that already exist, like templates or uh, communities to have conversations? Um, I believe they want templates. Uh, yes, there will be a recording. It'll be on our YouTube. Um, I believe they're looking for templates. Yeah, templates. Templates. Mike, you're probably best answer. Yeah. So, I mean, quite often we use, we have a template that we use in our, uh, in our uh, Atlassian uh, wiki site um, that, uh, that we've kind of adapted from the default one that they provided. Uh, I think you could start fairly small with this, to be honest. Um, if you take sort of the 10 headings that we had back on uh, earlier in the presentation, you can, you can create your own fairly, fairly easily. Uh, I am sure there are whole tools and suites of tools that help guide you through those processes as well, but I don't have one to recommend uh, in specific. Yeah, I know I was um, just thought off the top of my head, I was um, just looking at uh, some an, another presentation I had uh, uh, given with a, a different colleague a, a few months back. We were talking about 
um, building processes into your uh, PSA platform so that you had like a, a workflow kind of thing that you would go through. And I'm picturing, you know, ideally, we don't want to create a lot of overhead, but to have that process just defined um, inside a tool to say, hey, this was it, whether I can take a specific incident that happened and just click a button that says, hey, start RCA, that brings me through capturing all this information. That would be a really cool um, sort of implementation of it to have. So you could kind of do that with manage. Yeah. Um, you could either use ticket templates um, or configurations by adding a new configuration and adding it to the ticket. Um, yeah. I'm unsure about other platforms, but uh, while it's not like fancy, like it should be, um, it is possible. Um, yeah. But uh, the benefit there is you know where the documentation is, right? It's always in the same spot. Uh, and, you know, we all know that sort of the importance of having that standardized documentation. So you know where it's going to be. You can find it later. Um, yeah, and it's already in that source okay. of truth. Do you have yeah. a recommended starting RCA? Do you, do you recommend starting RCA before a problem is fully resolved, assuming the size of the issue is one that would require one? Yeah, this is a really good, uh, really good question. And, and so I find there is an advantage certainly to, to starting some of these steps while the incident is still in, in process. And it depends obviously on the length of the incident and the complexity of it. But uh, certainly if you imagine uh, building up a timeline of what happened during the incident, that's a lot easier to do in the moment if you have some way to capture, okay, it is, you know, for example, if you have a Slack chat going on or, or some other some other forum to at least be able to say, this is what we're doing and you've got a timestamp with it, you can later take that and extract it into some more formal uh, documentation of what happened during the incident. Um, sometimes when you're in the heat of the moment, like I said before, it's hard to remember what you did and what time you did it and who did what. And so just having a culture where as part of incident response, you are documenting who's doing what at what time. Um, sometimes if it's a really big uh, event, you could have one person whose job is just doing that. Typing in Slack, you know, Steve is responding in this way and Kyle's responding in that way. And now you've got uh, that record that you can refer to later. Um, so certainly in, in terms of, of keeping track of the response, I think it's really important. Some, some of the things are harder to answer in the moment, like the five whys analysis, you kind of need to know all of the information before you can do that really effectively, at least in my experience. But I, um, you know, I'm sure there are, there are different, different ways you could approach it as well. Yeah, that's what's yeah. Gonna be my comment before you got to it, Mike, was that, you know, that if, if you're getting down to the, the five whys, the root cause, like you kind of need to wrap up the incident to really have all the information to start to, to run that process. Yeah, I was getting yes. ready to say exactly what Gavin just said in chat is that uh, that if you're starting RCA and you're and you're getting ready to do that, that it doesn't impact your actual ability to respond and recover your client that's down, mm -hmm. um, because a client, uh, you know, the whoever's working on the issue will does have a tendency to, as Gavin puts it, you know, pull out the blame stick and lose the ability to actually resolve the issue. And what could be a timely matter? Um, That's right. So yeah, yeah, reducing the the level of of formality in the moment is sometimes a good thing in in order to be able to recover quickly and, and make sure the right people are not overburdened with process at the time. But uh, things like that response timeline, um, I see. Yeah, um, Vaughn says in the chat there. You know, detection, response, and recovery. Those sorts of things are generally fairly easy to discover or to document in the moment. Um, and also the kinds of things that you might kind of forget after the fact, like uh, the, the incident's over, it's all recovered. And now you're trying to remember, oh yeah, why do we even start working on that? We've been, we've been heads down for the last hour trying to sort that out. Well, what was it that caused us to think about it in the first place? And, and so you find this problem leads to that problem leads to that problem. It's like, what was the first problem we were trying to solve again? Right. You can't. Right. Right. It, uh, yeah, no, uh, our CTO, I my current company just had this, you know, conversation with our help desk. He had a, a webinar on it about um, just, you know, discovering what the actual issue is and documenting what the client's actually saying, not processing and putting, actually document what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, like if they're saying my Outlook won't connect, don't type in Outlook offline, type in my Outlook won't connect. Because right. there's things that you're processing for the client that you may be omitting or you may be, you know, misunderstanding from their perspective that you may get or someone else who happens to pop in and give a look may right. 
pick up on that you won't because you missed information that the client actually did tell you. Yeah, or, or made an assumption and then that gets mm-hmm. so ingrained in your mind that you can't get away from that. So yeah, I think that's a, a, really, good, uh, a really good point. Sort of one of the reasons that we tend to, to just document, uh, someone said in the chat, uh, Gavin said, you know, facts only, right? Like that, just, just write down what you're dealing with, the facts of what it is, not your color or your interpretation on that. A lot of that can happen later. Um, and uh, so. When you have time. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Because nobody ever has enough time. Yeah. I think that's it for the question. I don't see any more. Uh, yeah, Chaz, uh, one reason why after a call with the client, I send a follow-up email transcribing the conversation. Yeah. So don't document it. I wonder if I'll have a job after this. I mean, that's the whole idea behind blameless root cause, right? So, I mean, you could document that yeah. and see how many times you messed up. And I guess critique yourself on your ability to A, have a job after you think you're going to lose it and B, how many times you've messed up enough to lose your job that you think at least. Yeah. Well, well I mean, I, I'm happy to, if there's, uh, I know um, given we're sort of in the, the vendor spotlight, if anyone wants to see a, a demo, if we want to jump into Ovid quickly, I can show a couple of tools inside the, the product that can help with that. Or if, uh, we want to wrap it up just given we have only a few minutes left let me know let's go ahead um all right i i will say that uh my experience with alvic has always been fantastic um alvic was actually one of msp geeks first uh vendor individuals who were uh hung out joined the community and assisted everything and answered questions and they had their first vendor channel and um Mm-hmm. I've always had a fantastic experience um, dealing with support, sales, everything I've ever had to do. Um, so that's my personal experience. Um, I know that's a couple of others' experiences as well. Um, it's definitely symbiotic, right? Like you, in this kind of community, you also um, get out what you put in as well, right? So we're we're happy to be a part of it and be able to uh, you know hear and learn from the community as well. So. Um, so we, we talked, uh, you know, just a couple of things that for the specific use case, um, you know, we, we talked about making a misconfiguration. And although I, you know, at this point, I can't prevent you from, from doing that. Um, you know, some of the tools inside the platform that allow me to see previous configurations, right? Highlight what the, the previous running configuration of a device may have been. I can then quickly go back in time and um, resolve things quicker. Um, I can also jump in and see uh, via the audit log um, what kind of, uh, activity may have happened. So if someone was, you know, remotely logging into this device, this doesn't look like anything's happened over the last 10 minutes, but let's just say I looked in the last week and, you know, I'm not trying to lay blame, but I still want to know what happened. I can look at, you know, all the people that have touched this device or everyone that has interacted with it. So we can start to get some of that visibility. Um, and I can also see other things that are happening on the network too. So if we're um, trying to explore other avenues that may have impacted this issue, um, so we talked about this, you know, specific device that was out, um, you know, what are all the, the uh, or what's the impact, right? What, what are all the users impacted? Well, if this switches out, then I know everything downstream of it is affected. So I can start to use the map topology to help me understand the impact of the incident. Um, I can look at the you know, performance of this device over time to see if there was something maybe happening on the device leading up to it. Um, you know, I'm really flying through things here, but, uh, you know, opening up the, um, the NetFlow data to help me understand, well, you know, what, what kind of traffic was traversing through the network? Was there, you know, traffic coming from a source that I wasn't expecting? Um, of course, there's got to be a demo fail. <laughs> it always happens, right? So if I'm, I can look and see, well, if there is traffic on the network that I wasn't expecting, uh, or what kind of traffic was there on the network, I can really start to gain insight into what was happening all around that. Uh, and then, you know, we kind of alluded to it earlier, but, but most importantly, like, you know, the worst place to be in is that detection, be, you know, your client calling you and saying, hey, things are down. Um, I think it's unavoidable, like we're never going to get to 100% uh, proactive detection. Um, but we can continue to strive to get better on there. So, you know, what kind of um, alerting framework can I put in place to make sure that when something goes wrong with one of my monitors, I'm, I'm told about that. Uh, so if you're, you know, not monitoring um, the network devices today and getting, you know, the proactive alerts on that in the places that make sense to you, um, whether that's, you know, inside uh, ConnectWise or other PSAs um, or Slack, email, Teams, those kind of things. So 
having that knowledge, hopefully before the client can allow you to get that uh, the jump start on it. So I won't dive much deeper in that. I don't really want to uh, spray product too much, but thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit. And um, if you are interested uh, in taking a look, if you're not a current Ovic partner, I did drop a link uh, to get started there in the chat. And so feel free to take a look. Vaughn does have a question for you about monitoring STP root changes. So um, we, if I heard the question right, we do have alerts uh, built in that tell me when uh, the spanning tree changes occur. So if there's two uh, physically connected links, two switches connected together, and we identify one switches from forwarding to blocking or vice versa, um, you'll get an alert on that. It's not going to uh, necessarily show you the whole um, spanning tree map, but you'll get an alert that, hey, something's changed, which if you didn't make a change, if you weren't expecting that, uh, definitely a bit of a, a red flag. Cool. I don't know what that means because I hate networking. Um, it's, <laughs> it's my worst IT thing. That and telephony. Just my, br my brain doesn't comprehend it for some reason. So stuff like this is fantastic for me personally. I love it. It's, it makes everything much more understandable besides looking at the individual configs. I, I, I'm, I'm biased, but of course I, I love the map. Um, God, that's the best thing. I'll be like, oh, it's super, super nice. The context I can get is like, it's amazing. Yeah, and you, it, it, it can get a little finicky in certain places with complicated networks, but you can still get the gist of it. And it's it's uh, amazing, way better than any map I've seen. Yeah. Cool. All right, why don't I stop the share there just as we're getting to the end of the, the time uh, so everyone can wrap up and get to their, you know, 4 p.m. meeting if you're in the East or get to your, uh, you know, 9 p.m. pint if you're over in, in the UK. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, we, we do have an Avic channel. So Avic is available in MSP geek under V dash Avic. Um, they're, they're pretty much all the time, uh, American at least, or Canadian, Canadian time zones. Um, yeah. I so just, it, uh, just yeah, share no. my screen here. Hopefully if, uh, just drop up one more splash screen there, if there's anything else, but uh, thanks yeah, everyone no. for the time today. Yeah. I recommend checking out if you have it. Um, it, it makes up a, a, it, it fills in a, a gap that a lot of uh, current RMM tools lack, and they do it very, very well. All right. Thanks, everyone, for the time today. Kyle, thanks so much for having us on. Michael, thank you for your contributions of being our SME here. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Everyone have a fantastic like This is going up on YouTube later, so uh, everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. Cheers. Bye-bye.